you wish you could learn something on Thursday and play in the church on Sunday? <laughs> Oh, it doesn't mean that anymore. 
Oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. It may not be the way you remember it, but just because you don't know the truth of how that became into being does not mean that Satan does, doesn't remember. And that's exactly what he wants us to do. He wants to take God's absolutely clearly evidence and blur them so that everything looks what? Okay. When God says, this is true, Satan wants to say, is it really? Now, how do you know that? What was the first temptation? Did God really say that? In other words, let's blur the vision. And they only had two. Don't eat of this and don't eat of that. And they still got blurred. Wow. Now, that's the works of the flesh. And uh, did you know that the text right there says, and the works of the flesh keeps us from doing what would please God. Because once we get caught up in the flesh, it is awfully hard to try to stay pure and holy and even desire pure and holiness when we're caught up in the flesh, caught up in the flesh, caught up in the flesh. Now this week, we're going to start talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Now remember, it is the word fruit. The word there for fruit is karpos. It is in the nominative singular noun. What in the world does that mean? It means it is a noun that is the subject of the, the verb. And so it is the fruit. And it is always in the singular when it is in that position. So this sentence is always then in the nominative case. Now, everybody knows that comes from the Latin, from causes homiciesis, and where we get the, the case for naming. So what kind of a name is this? It is a noun that says the name of what? It is the fruit. It is not just a fruit. It is the fruit. It is different from any other fruit. You know, there are a lot of intrinsically good people in this world. Do you know any? That don't go to church. You know, there are some other religions that don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. And they've got good people in there too. Really good people. Sometimes even gooder than our people. That's how you conjugate Christian verbs. <laughs> Sometimes to our shame. The fruit of the Spirit singular is, and this is a verb. Now this is where we're going to take a look at the front side and the back side of your paper. If you go to the English Bible and you look up this word and say, what's the Strong's number for this verse? Who knows what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Nobody. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Okay. Let's take a vote. So only Karen and I know what I'm talking about. All right. This is the problem. You go to this verse and you look up the word is, Strong's going to give you a certain number, and the number that it's going to give you will bring up the word me. Now here's the problem. There it is in the Greek and in the transliterated into the English. Here's the problem. You look this word up in the Greek and it's the word estin. Estin. The word me is not in that sentence in Greek. But what is the best English word to put in there for the word is? It's the word is. But what is the word is in the Greek? Can it be emi? Yes. But mostly it's the plural are or am. When Jesus said, I am, he says, ami, I am. He doesn't say, I is. But he could. But the better word for that when we're talking about that the flesh or the, the works of the fruit is is the word estin. So if you looked up this word just in your Strong's concordance, guess what? You're looking up the wrong word. In this verse, it's the word estin. This is where you got to remember. A little bit of Greek can cause a whole lot of trouble. So be careful. Because if you go up to somebody and you say, just like that, that verse where the Spirit is in me, and they go, it's estin. And they go, what other words are you misusing? <laughs> we need to be careful. Now, uh, as we take a look, the fruit of the Spirit is, and it says, it doesn't say the fruit of the Spirit is R. Now, how many times have you seen pictures like this? By good nature preachers, I think. And by good nature graphic designers. But how many of us know this is not one piece of fruit? This is lots of different pieces of fruit. And so it does not say the fruits of the Spirit are, but it says the fruit of the Spirit is. It's one life, 
one tree with the amalgamated all of them, all nine of them, living in your life. Now, they might not all have dominance at all times. Sometimes something will happen in our lives, and we'll have the spirit of joy uh, and the fruit of joy much stronger than we have patience. But sometimes God needs to give us real patience. And you might say, I'm not a patient person. But something happens, and all of a sudden, a spirit of patience just overwhelms you. Because why? The spirit of God is in you. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. Why? Because God loves you. Wow. And so we're supposed to have access and capability, not of one or two, but of all of them, all the time. Maybe not in full measure, complete, balanced. Say, you know, we've got a, a ninth and a ninth and a ninth and a ninth. No, no, that's not how it works. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit is, and then he starts laying them out. Now, you should see on your paper, you've got love and joy and peace. Did you know that the word for patience is sometimes translated long-suffering? Uh, and in some of the newer translations of the Bible as well. And so you'll get that reason why in just a minute. Kindness. Did you know that the word for goodness is also the word for generosity? Because how can you say you're good to somebody if you're not generous? And if you are generous, people usually consider that you are good. And so we'll take a look at that. It is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We'll just go ahead and throw up the Greek words for those as we go ahead and drop down. Now you would say, am I going to be responsible? You've got them on your paper. So don't look at me like, oh, those weren't up there long enough. You've already got them all on your paper if you have your paper. Today, we're just going to take a look at the word agape. Now, there is love in its original language in the Koine Greek. Now, if you take a look at the back of your paper, I've given you the Koine Greek alphabet. This is very important to remember. You can't say the Greek alphabet without saying Koine. Because the Greek alphabet of today is different than the Greek alphabet of the Bible time. The Koine Greek had slightly different letterings and slightly different word endings, word beginnings, uh, compound words. And so if you were to go to the Greece today and say, well, you know, you know agape, and they might spell it. They might say it. Some people say agape. Anybody ever hear it said that way? That's how they say it in, in, in secular Hellenistic Greek in Greece right now. It's agape. We have always predominantly heard it as because that's Koine. It's sort of like Castilian versus Spanish. Are they similar? Are they the same? No. There are enunciational differences. In the English, we always put the long vowel sign over the E. That is not to make it sound like an E. Many of us would say, well, you know, it, what is the last letter in that? It's an eta. I want you to take your paper and turn over to the back and look down your Greek alphabet until you see the, the letter eta. Now that's the last letter in this word in the original language. It looks like our letter in. And that is always pronounced eh, 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 eta. Now they usually don't say the tough part. And so you would say agape. A, and that's why we put the, the line over the E to remember that it's a long vowel sign. Now, as we continue to build words, you can keep this, you can discard that if you would like to. But what we want to do now is instead of doing more grammar, let's do more theology. If you have your Bible, take a look at John 3.16. How many of you say, I don't have to look it up? <laughs> but you know what? I have discovered that in the day's world, with so many people who have never been to church and have never been to Sunday school, and we just all of a sudden say it, guess what? They don't know. And somebody might be watching by way of YouTube, and they don't know. And so what we want to do is make sure that we show them that we're not just saying something, we prove it because we can go to it. And so here we are in John chapter 3. How many of us know that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus? And in the process of talking to Nicodemus, he points out that God is love, because the technical uh, concept of the word agape was very rarely used as love. It was usually translated benevolence or charity. Because somebody needed something. You go by and somebody has sitting there with a basket out and they would put in their 
alms, if you will, into their basket. And the activity of actually putting money into that person's basket, guess what in, in secular Greek at the day of Jesus, guess what the action of putting money into that basket was called? Agape. It was actually doing something for someone who couldn't do it for themselves, but they really needed to have it done. It wasn't an emotional connection. It, it wasn't just a, a, a brotherly connection. You know, you can love someone with emotions. You can love someone because they're familia. They're your family. But to do something for someone that has neither of those things connected to you just because you saw that person really needed it is agape. And take a look at John 3.16. What does it say? For God so agape the world that he did something about it. Now, when did he do it? You would say, well, in 33 AD. No, no, that's not when he did it. What does the book of Revelation say? That before he ever said, let there be light, Jesus was already the sacrificial lamb who was what? Slaughtered. When did he do something about it? From eternity past. I don't think God woke up one day and said, well, I think Jesus will be slaughtered one day. I think Jesus always knew. God always knew. The Spirit always knew. But in our world, that is time restraint. In his world, there is no such thing as time. In our world, that's time restraint. All of a sudden, it became time sensitive because it was time for him to die. Did you realize that when Jesus died, he said he died even the right time? Even the right time. Let's take a look at another. John is such a passionate man by the way he writes. Let's take a look at, at uh, 1 John 4.8. Now, he's talking about getting along with people, and especially inside the fellowship. And anyone who does not love does not know God because God is agape. God is agape. In other words, if we were to look up, you ever heard somebody say, well, if you look up that word, you just see a picture of somebody. If we were to, if we could, and, and take the, all the different dictionaries, and, and when it says, Love, I have a picture of the cross. <clears throat> Isn't that the picture of love? And who is on the cross? God, Jesus. And so uh, the picture is, for God so loved that he did something about it. Why did he do something about it? Because God estin, not in me, God estin, agape. Deo estin. Isn't it perfect that this is the first one in the list? Because if we don't get this one right, we're not going to get any of the rest of them. And, and if we're not working on this one, did you know that before the last supper, let's go to John chapter 13. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper here in just a few minutes. And, and here as they were preparing to do the pre-Lord's Supper. Now before the Feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, it wasn't just some subsequent hour. It was the appointed time in God's calendar of events that today is the day. When the hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having done what? Having agape his own who were in the world, he agape them to the very end. Have you ever done something for somebody and the more you do it for them, the less excited you are about doing it for them? Somebody's going to come over, you know, you, you do something, and then they say, well, what time should I be back tomorrow? <laughs> okay. What time should I be back tomorrow? Well, okay. Well, what time should I be back tomorrow? Can you imagine what it was like living with the disciples? Now, what had the disciples just been doing prior to this event? Arguing among themselves who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That was one of their favorite things to do. Uh, there are some people that just love to argue. But I think what they were trying to do is they were doing this shuffling of the team to see who was going to rise to the top. It was almost like, I'm going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to sit next to his right hand. Why would you even want to be there if it wasn't for ego? You see, if I really want to be there, I should not even be thinking about it. I should be thinking what I can do, regardless. I'll just be happy to be in glory. I'll be happier if he could say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. 
I will be most happy if because of uh, what few talents some of us may think we have, God used in such miraculous ways that people came there because of you, because of me. And here they are arguing. Let's take a look down at verse 30. Jesus then turns around after they're arguing, loving them, he washes their feet. So after receiving this morsel of bread, meaning Judas is carrying he leaves and immediately went out. And it was at the night time. Now when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him and through him. In God, as skin, glorified in him. In other words, he didn't say, in God I me. Now if you look this word up in the English and you try to do your strongest word, it's going to give you the wrong word again. Be careful. Make sure you go to the original Greek. And in him, God is glorified. And God will also glorify himself in him. And, and notice, glory to glory to glory to glory. And then he says, little children. Now, why do you think he has to call them little children? Because only little children should be arguing at those kinds of things at this kind of time. Little children. Yet, yeah, little while I'm with you, you will seek me. In a little while, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you. Now, it doesn't say a new suggestion. When God said it, he expects us to get it and to do it. Is that asking too much? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. You know, have you ever been told you got to love somebody you didn't want to? And yet, isn't that exactly what God said? When all of a sudden they drive into your village and arrest all of the Christians in your village and then blow up your place of worship, what does the Bible say we're supposed to do about that? Pray for and love them. That doesn't mean don't defend yourself, but pray for and love them. And so it says, little children, he says, I give you this new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Now, when did God start loving us? Before he ever made the world. Uh, we're going to find out, it says in the book of Romans, while we were yet still sinners. I want you to love them while they're still sinners. You are also to love one another. Now, why? Verse 35. Because if you do, because there is an if there in there. And when we have an hypothesis, what is the definition of the equation of a hypothesis? If this then that. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. If you will love people, then the world, not the church. <clears throat> you see, I think the reason why the world doesn't understand who God really is is because we haven't shown the word the estin of karpos. The is a fruit. You see, we'll love those who are okay. We'll shun those who... Think about this. If Jesus loved, did he? Did he? If Jesus loved, and if Jesus lives in me. Now here's the question, is he? The only way for him to be in there is if you ask him to come into your life and be your Savior, forgive you of your sins, to take the penalty of the punishment that I deserve so that I get what I don't deserve, and that's God's grace through his grace. So if Jesus loved, and if Jesus lives in me, then we should be recognized by our agape. Now I'm going to say agape because you say this in the new world today and they might not get it. But I think we need to know that means agape. We know that means what? By the way, we should be recognized by our love. For who? For our moms and dads? For our sons and daughters? For the neighbor who consistently hates us? For the person at work that goes out of their way to cut off my fingers? Who do we love? According to the Bible, we should be recognized as people. Let's take a look and see if this is just a, 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 a mere thought or is it consistent with systematic theology. Let's take a look at first Corinthians. How many of us know First Corinthians 13 is called the love chapter? Anybody know that? And it never says what love feels like. But it does say what love does. 
So in other words, love is doing something. What was the definition of agape in Jesus' world? It was doing something about a situation because it really needed to be done. For God so agape the world, he did something about it. Now notice what it says in verse number 13. So now faith, hope, and love live on, <coughs> abide. These three, but the greatest. Now this Greek word for greatest is megas. Does it sound familiar to anybody? So the mega, the, the power, it's also the word for earthquake. Mega seismos is the word for earthquake, where we get seismology. Mega seismos. But the greatest, the mega of these three is this one. The greatest of these, here's the word, the greatest of these is, it's a different word now, it's two times. What does this word mean? It means the megas is this one. Not just this act, but the one doing that act. The greatest is this one, agape. The greatest is the agape person, the one who is actually doing what God has commanded us to do. Faith, we can have a lot of faith. We can have a lot of hope. Our hope is in Christ. Amen. What does our hope need to do? It needs to signify and recognize us to the world that we are his by the way in which we do something with our faith. The writer James says this, don't just tell me about your faith, show it to me. Now, you don't show it to him by bringing up your Bible, seeing how many passages you've got under it. You do it by bringing up your life and seeing how many effects you have had with your love. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to say people are going to love you when you do that. They didn't love Jesus, they're probably not going to love us either. But that doesn't negate the fact that we're supposed to do it. What if you would have just said, nah, they didn't love me enough. I'm not doing the cross today. Maybe next week they'll be more deserving. Let's take a look at Romans 5. I'm going to emphasize just a couple of verses. Let's take a look at Romans 5. 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's agape has been poured into our hearts. God loves us so much that he didn't leave us orphans. He actually put himself, injected himself into our hearts. Now this word here for poor means more than just poor. It means overflow. Uh, have you seen those commercials where somebody's not watching, they're pouring coffee into somebody's coffee cup and they're looking the other way, and it's flowing over and, you know, uh, it, it's almost as if, it's not that God's not paying attention. God is paying so much attention, he says, I don't want to cheat you of even one drop. There used to be a famous copy that, coffee that says, good to the last drop, so fill it to the rim with rim and all of those others. In other words, God says, I love you so much, I'm not going to give you a dash of this and a sprinkle of that. I'm going to run your heart to overflow. How does he do that? Through the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at verse number 8. St. Jack. But God showed his agape. But God showed his agape for us and that while we were what? Yes. While we were still desperately, deeply, completely caught up in our sin, Christ died. Has it been consistent so far? I think it has been. God is love. He loved so much that he gave. He loved so much that he gave his son on the cross so that you and I, while we were still in our sins, could have the Holy Spirit lavishly applied to our hearts. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Paul asked this question, who shall separate us from the agape of Christ? Who shall separate us from that giving spirit of Jesus? And then he says, shall tribulation. Now, what is tribulation to you? Tribulation to you is coming to church and finding somebody sitting in the chair you always sit. <laughs> I was pastoring a church and a family had just visited the church for the very first time. A family that normally sat in those that exact pews that would sit in that exact pew, came in, and as I was welcoming them, like I'm going to talk to uh, Paul right now, as I'm walking there, like Christy, they walked right up, and they stood in the aisle. I thought they were going to say, good morning, good morning, and they stood in the aisle, and finally, obviously, this family was feeling a little uncomfortable. They looked at them, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, are we in your 
your seat? And, and the person said, yes, you are. Can you imagine? And this guy, seminary graduate. Tribulation. You, you see, most of us might take tribulation car accident. Let me tell you, there is not a greater tribulation than having a problem at church with other church people. That's tribulation. Distress. Persecution. Famine. So it sounds like the world today, doesn't it? Nakedness. Now this word here for nakedness does not just mean no clothes. But just be completely exposed all the time. No privacy. We're living in a world, you do something at a party, and it's going to be on YouTube in the next five minutes. Is that right? We are, expo we are living in glass houses all the time. Danger. The sword, the, uh, the answer to that is what? Nothing can separate us from the world of Christ. That's why he goes on to say this, and all these things we can be. Now you would say, it's, no, it says we are. But we are if we are in Christ all the time. When we all of a sudden choose to operate by the flesh, that means to go below what God has intended. We can fail to be conquerors in certain areas of our life. Anybody ever get saved and then still blow it? And then you say, I'm a conqueror as I'm blowing this. You don't talk like that. How many times, well, you know, even though we lost the game, it was a moral victory. I'll tell you what, if you lost, you lost. But you can still learn from it. <clears throat> but you don't get sprinkles. <laughs> okay. For I am persuaded. What does the word persuaded mean? Absolutely, positively, undeniably, irrefutably, I'm not changing I am not changed. For I am persuaded, what? That neither this, nor that, nor this, nor that, nor this, nor that, nor this, nor that. There's some pretty heavy stuff in there, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing can separate us, shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Now, where is it? It is in Christ. And where is he? If you know Jesus Christ, he is in you. Our love for God is shown by the way in which we treat. That's exactly what the Bible says. And by this, the world will what? Will know. It's the word gnosko. Shall experience. Not just say, okay, I know the right answer. How many of us know the right answer and still do the wrong thing? I know if I, this will be better. And then I still don't. I had a friend that went in for throat cancer. He had to have one of those little things put by his throat. Had that little hole and kept a little patch and learned how to smoke through it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say what sins are. I'm just saying once we develop a pattern, even though we may know I shouldn't do this, we still have the propensity to do it. Once we know that God is love and God has called us, commanded us to be loving, we have no right. We can't say no, I won't. As soon as you say no, I won't, we'll be looking at Jesus and saying, I won't do that. The Spirit is love, agape. So maybe we ask ourselves this question today, Lord Jesus, may the fruit of my Spirit, now what should the fruit of my Spirit be? Love, joy, peace, faith, right? May the fruit of my Spirit be the way in which I... Have you ever just intrinsically not liked somebody because of their ethnicity? Sin. Because of their different political party? Because of their different views on theology. Sin. Because they root for the wrong sports team. Sin. Because they live in the wrong country. Sin. God's commanded us to love one another. Because he loves us, we ought to love. What causes missionaries to go to worlds far away? Because God so loved them and called them and touched them that they would go. I can remember when Vicki was on the pastor search team and she asked me this one question Why in the world would you want to move to a bus pass? Do you remember that night when you asked me that question? Sure, I did. I, I, I know you did. Because we were sitting at the table and you were to my right, two down, and I right across from Pastor Carol, and, uh, and sitting right next uh, to. Uh, And so, uh, and you look at me and you said, why would anybody want to move to the city? And, and I said, well, for one, if God called me to, because there are people in the city 
push you out of bounds, to destroy you and beat you, can you still meet at the 50 yard line and join together? One man said about his neighbor, I ask God, I ask him to show me how he sees my neighbor. I'm thinking about making t shirts with this phrase on. This was inspired by Ann and Daryl yesterday. Uh, they were helping someone move, and uh, Ann is a hard worker. And Daryl, anybody know that? Daryl is a hard worker. And it was a little nippy when we started. Everybody was peeling off clothes as we were going along. And uh, the next thing you know, Ann's got a shirt on, and I think the shirt says what? Go through. And we started laughing about that. Now, how many of us know what this means? today as we come to what was known in the Corinthian church as the love feast. Help us to have a love feast with you and with one another today. Lord, I would pray that if there is anything that would be preventing us from being pure and honest and completely loving with you and loving with others for us to even pray about that and to reconcile it internal and then partake even to the point of doing something external with an internal decision that you and I do in us. And so, Father, again, I want to thank you for loving me. Even me with me. On the times when I'm sure you can shake your head and wonder, and yet at the same time, never stop doing it. And Father, there are times I shake my head and wonder about things in the world, about people that I, I, I see do things that I just don't understand why. I don't understand how they can behead someone like that. And it should anger us to love them. Because without you, there's really not any change. Father, the world is crying for more military action, but what we really need is a strong defense that's completely overcome with the power of prayer. So, Lord, today, as we think about all of the different out-of-balance things in the world, help us to realize that the first thing that will bring any real balance with substance is if the world 